And when teachers get the opportunity to get into ChatGPT or whatever they're using, Bard, Bing, whatever, um, see what it does, right? Try it. You, you can fear what you don't know easily. All the, oh my gosh, scary, how can I stop this? How about let's just try it? Like, I think once they try it, they'll be like, oh, you know, I mean, how helpful, how great, not so scary. Welcome everybody back to another exciting episode of the Undisrupted Podcast. Adam, I don't know if you've noticed lately, or if you've been on social media at all the last couple of weeks, but uh, as I look down at my phone now, I see that uh, the little blue bird is gone and there's a big black X. What is that about? Oh, I, I, I see you taking offense to it being a black, a big black X. No, <laughs> no, not at all. Why is it got? Why, why, why is it got to be black? No, it's the I'm just X. Saying, I mean, you know. Oh, oh, oh okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, what okay. What is that about, man? What is going? What are your? We were Adam and I have been on text chains with lots of different people, and and it's funny to watch slowly over the last week as people's apps have been changing to like oh, now mine is the X, and mine just like yesterday changed. Uh, thoughts on the on Elon switch because I know he's your buddy, he's your boy. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, man, I, I was ahead of the game when I told y'all what he was, James Bond villain. Uh, here's the thing. When I look at it, I have no reason. It, it, I, I don't understand why. Literally, you have a brand. Everyone recognizes the bird. Everyone knows it's Twitter. Even the the act of posting something is a tweet. It's a play on the word of Twitter. Right. I, with X, I don't know what to call it. I don't need... I don't even know what a domain. Uh, right now, it's still like Twitter.com. I, I think someone may own X.com, but that may not stop Elon from taking it because someone owned the handle at X and they literally just took it from him and gave him a T-shirt. So yeah. I don't know what's <laughs> going on here. I, 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 You know what? It doesn't necessarily bother me because it doesn't like put any money in my pocket. But I think it's silly. I think it uh, doesn't make much sense to change it to X. Um, uh, it's, it's a rebrand that no one asks for. Yeah, I can't. Uh, and what, I can't what are your thoughts on that. I can't help, but always hear the DMX uh, song in the back of my head. X going to give it to you. Every time I <laughs> see the letter now, I like think of that. And it's not a rebrand like a McDonald's to like, let's say a McDowell's. I mean, it's not, it's not even close, right? We went from a little blue sweet bird that tweets little things to an X that just does X and who knows what that actually means. But Enough about what my thoughts are, because I would like to bring on the show a friend of the podcast. Who's been, we haven't had her on the show yet, but we've known Jenneth for forever. Jenneth Mishney, she's the Director of Educational Technology at Newport Mesa Unified School District there in Costa Mesa, beautiful Costa Mesa, California. Jenneth, what are your, welcome to the show, but also what are your thoughts on the Twitter X thing? Well, thank you for having me, uh, Carl and Adam. I'm, I'm happy to be here. And I had to look because like you, it hadn't switched over on my phone. As soon as you said that, I pulled it up and ugh. It's there. <laughs> and I feel like now I just, I, I think because of being on computer programs and X is where I close things, right? X is Ooh. out. Ooh. I am not for the X. I, I agree. There's a brand and I, I don't understand it. I don't really, I feel like it's um, a power play, a positioning, a look at me, I can do whatever I want kind of thing. And I feel like we're getting away from what Twitter was about, which is sharing 140 characters of good information. Yeah. Small. It's so weird because it literally was the thing it, with no competitors. I mean, it, you literally said, tweet me at, when you saw at something, you know exactly what that was. That's Twitter. At whatever, that's your Twitter handle. I'm going to tweet you. That's what it is. That's now, what it's so every podcast. Yeah. Yeah, it's so fragmented. Yeah. Yeah, it's so fragmented now. X me at Jenna. Yeah, X me. <laughs> that just sounds weird. Like, I want to X you up. Wait, that's a different song. <laughs> I mean, tell me bad, but I think that we need to really, <laughs> really think about this. I. Yeah, I, I, there's a, that's right. There's also the psychological part of that, right? Like, what does it mean, right? And I like what you just said, Jonathan. It is kind of being anti X because 
Xing things out is is like is closing yourself off. And and maybe that's the long play here. Maybe there's some diabolical thing that Adam's been alluding to for several years. If you go back and listen to other episodes that has to do with taking over the world, that maybe this is all about. And we don't even know it. We're just doing the social commentary on it, which is kind of sad. <laughs> but um, one day everybody's going to look back and they will remember the podcast that we said he's a james bond villain this is all a ploy you know he has the look he has the feel i can see him just plotting in his secret lab on an island somewhere you know twiddling his fingers together yep. <laughs> this is you good, know uh, marvel movie in the future yes yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. That's X, true. Professor X, yes. <laughs> so, so Jenith, let, let, you know, now that we've had a little fun there, uh, let's let's get to learn a little bit about your district. Um, you have a pretty diverse district uh, where you're working at. So, how does your department manage uh, making sure kids get equitable experiences when it comes to technology? Great question. Um, we we are one to one Chromebook. Uh, district. We were going that way bef- in a phased approach before the pandemic um, and then went there a lot faster. Um, we offer hotspots, uh, all kinds of solutions to all families because we are, we do, um, we have two cities in our district, Newport Beach and Costa Mesa, and they're really nice areas of Costa Mesa and then areas that, you know, are less socioeconomical advantaged. And so um, sometimes I feel like the schools on what we call like the west side versus the east side of Costa Mesa actually are more have more advantage with the technology in the schools because they have access to more funding, whether it's through Title I or, you know, other grants that they were given or you know, anonymous donations because they are more, you know, uh, struggling school financially. Um, but, and on the Newport beach side, we actually, a lot of our families don't appreciate the fact that they feel like they pay for everything for the schools. Right. So they don't have, those schools don't have as many funds. So at the district level, we try to even level both of those playing fields And we've really been looking at all of our tools and our technology to say, okay, you know, is this a tool for every kid? And if so, well, then the district should be footing the bill, not the school, not the families, not some organization. We feel value in it. Let's buy it for everyone. And um, that's been a more recent approach. And we are getting a lot of good um, feedback from both sides. They very much appreciate us looking at things in that manner. On that, and that lens, do you see with the apps in particular? Because the one thing Adam and I have talked about on previous episodes is like the. So now you've got the devices in the hands of every kid. Are they? Do you see a difference in how they're being used in both areas of your community? Because I think what we've seen kind of generally across the country is in the lower socioeconomic, it's more drill and kill. It's more kind of the, like, let's get them on the apps to get their math and reading scores up versus on the higher socioeconomic. It's more like the creative, innovative, entrepreneur types of things. So are you seeing that a little bit still, or are you, is it your job to kind of level that out as much as you can? Um, another great question. And so I'm, I'm fortunate to have an incredible team of uh, TOSAs, Teachers on Special Assignment. Uh, so I have three uh, incredible humans that do work, you know, in the classroom. I don't see it as much ver- school versus school or, you know, Newport Beach, Costa Mesa. I actually see it um, more like even t- classroom per classroom. To classroom. Really oh. Down to, you know, who got a little bit of, you know, the fire lit under them and they saw this great way to innovate in their classroom or we have developed a program. I'm not going to get into it a lot here, but it's called the digital fellow program. And we really wanted to recreate our talent at, at, you know, a larger level. And so um, teacher applies to become a digital fellow and it's a two year program. We pay them a large stipend and they get a coach, one of my TOSAs. And it's the first year is all about like, Adam, you're the digital fellow. We are all about you, Adam. What do you wanna learn? What do you wanna do in your classroom? What technology do you want 
to, you know, get better at. And we really focus on the teacher and building their skills. And then they share with their staff, like that's part of their give back. And they have a monthly um, accountables that they have to do every, you know, month to just show us what they're doing. And then year two, they still work with the coach just a little less often. And now they have to plan some PD at their school and we support them and their coach. And so they start to teach their teachers. And then we, um, they, we have 10 at any time of these digital coaches and a fellow, a second year fellow can apply to become a coach. And, um, and then they, you know, they go at a higher level, they get a higher stipend, but then they also do some district PD and, um, and so it's been really a really solid program that we keep, we just keep reinventing because we notice like, oh, we need to change this or this worked great, but this didn't. And um, so that I think is what allows a teacher at a, you know, a West Side school to do an incredible things versus, you know, another teacher that just hasn't gotten into using technology as much. I mean, that program hits so, checks so many boxes and hits so many marks. You know, when you look at like in the future ready framework, we look at personalized professional learning, you know, how how you could to address that. You're, you're hitting that mark there. Also, you know, building teacher self-efficacy uh, around the technology usage and also growing your own. Uh, as we know, you, you have who you have. There's not a, a minor league of, of teachers that you can just call up that young prospect uh, into, into the fold. So you, you see people who have that, that ability there, and then you kind of grow, nurture it and, and build them, build that skill set so they can help others. So I, I really love that, that aspect of that program. So it kind of leads me to something else that you do, which is you're also an, an adjunct at uh, Cal State Fullerton. So what has that been like for you and what crossover do you see you know, in that program that you're adjuncting with with your uh, fellow program with aspiring teachers, how do all that mesh together? It it's brilliant. Let me just say that. No, it's <laughs> like a dream because how often do you want to um, teach what you practice, practice what you teach, right? So I get to do that. I get to take what I'm doing in my day job and. Um, what my practice is and then share it with teachers from all over the world because the program's online small little plug masters in education technology cal state fullerton um, <laughs> put a link then, in the podcast yeah <laughs> and then um and then i learn i learn from all of these teachers they i i sometimes i'll tell the students in in the cal state fullerton program like I don't know who's getting more out of this, you or me, because I get to hear what teachers are doing all over. And, um, you know, we have courses in there that talk about teacher PD and how to do that or, um, you know, uh, visual design principles or how to look at instructional materials and, you know, effectively or, you know, all of those things. And so um, I've shared the Digital Fellow program with students. They, you know, some have taken it and, you know, tried a different model. Um, and so I just think that I, I really feel fortunate that I'm able to um, take something from both of those and, you know, use them in, in each, you know, of the areas that I work with. So yeah, that, that's something that I think more tech leaders need to be a part of, because I know personally, I get a chance to do some adjunct work as well with the University of Missouri. And um, this summer I did a course or it's t uh, technology and social studies classrooms. And so one of the things, one of my goals with the course I was teaching this summer was with the assignments that I was building out was really to allow teachers at time to develop those technology lessons that we all talk about you need to have. So it's, this is going to be a multi-week assignment, but we're going to go through this process. We're going to share the resources, the stuff that you normally would want to do, but you don't have time to do. Let's do it in this course. And so I think it's really beneficial when you have folks who have been in the school buildings, who have those connections and understand technology to really help grow these technology uh, savvy teachers. So to your point earlier, it shouldn't matter which teacher you have. 
if all those teachers have that skill on integrating technology, the, it, the kids are going to benefit from it. They're going to have that learning experience and really become positive users of technology. Absolutely. And I think one of the other things you, you hit on there that I think is important, and as Adam just talked about with leaders, is you're also learning uh, in your role. So you're continually learning, you're getting, you have this wide swath of, of, of different types of skill sets that you're getting from across the country in an online program like that. And so I'm sure one of the things that's come up in the recent few months is what everyone's been talking about, AI, of course. Uh, and so I'm curious what your angle lens, uh, we checked the box, yeah, we did contractually obligated, we mentioned it again on this season. This is the AI season. Uh, hot take, on Janice, Janice, hot take on AI from from both lenses, the lenses of your, your adjunct professorship, but also as that as your uh, director of ed tech, what, what's, what's your thoughts? Sure. Well, back um, earlier this year, you know, what, October, it hit kind of the mainstream. And then by January, we were already like, okay, what do we, what's our approach? How are we doing this? Are we blocking it as a district? What do we think? And right away, we were of the mindset, no, like, doesn't matter. We can block it all we want. Like, we know kids walk around with technology in their pocket, right? That's nothing new. So we thought, let's get ahead of it and be proactive. And so we we in February, we sent out messages to teachers, principals, parents, and students saying, and we put together this whole FAQ about AI. What is it? How do I learn more about it? What, what do I need to be afraid of? You know, all of the questions that a parent, a teacher might ask. We put this document together and we sent it out. I mean, it was like crickets. We really got uh, <laughs> Really? Did they read it? Did they? Did it go it? out? Did it get stuck in spam? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Like parents, I, I just think there, I mean, what do you think? Like there's this percent of the population really into it and the rest are like, huh? What? You know? And so, um, which is great because it gives us time to really grapple with it and make some good decisions to then raise awareness and educate everyone else around us, I feel. And so, um, you know, for the last, like you probably, you know, since th this whole year, I've just been like, you know, a sponge taking in whatever I can, trying, learning, jumping on this, doing a boot camp, uh, watching this, reading this, the state came out with its report, eh, you know, typical, <laughs> right? <laughs> wow. I love the, eh, so much and so little words as you just mentioned by going, eh. <laughs> it was, it was what it was. Um, but wow. I've been working with um, Saba Kuda. Have you heard of her? Oh, she's, she's amazing. I love Saba. Amazing. Yeah, she's so out there too. And, um, yep. So I saw her first at a OCQ local event. She keynoted back in February. And then um, I saw her again in March at Big Q out in Palm Springs. She's actually coming here. Oh, then I did her AI boot camp. Fantastic. She approaches it from the academic side. I love it. You know, she is just, she's great. She's coming. She's doing a um, whole day with my teachers on the 17th of August. We've got Joe Marquez coming in. He's going to do his thing. Um, we're going to bring our Digital Learning Day back uh, October 7th, and they're both going to come in keynote. And so we are pro AI, but, but we want guardrails. We want teachers to understand, you know, keep it, you know, don't put the personal into it. Um, cheating. I mean, we might as well go back to when Google was invented, right? <laughs> sure. Right. I hate to say it, but the teachers that freaked out about Google are freaking out about AI and they still haven't changed their thoughts. They haven't. Right. So that's not a me problem. <laughs> and so I think, I think it's amazing. I mean, is it, are there scary pieces of it? Of course, but it's technology. It's the future and used appropriately. It's a great opportunity to teach ethics and what is appropriate, which we should be doing anyway, but just gives us a little bit of a, a push. Um, and if you know your students, you know when they're not submitting their own work, right? Whether you're in a master's program or you're in a, you know, a 11th grade classroom. If you know your students writing, but personally, professionally, it is amazing it, as a thought partner. It is my thought partner. I love to run ideas by it. It helps me generate ideas. It helps 
you know, my brain work. It asks me questions that I'm like, oh, you know, or gives me ideas that I may not have thought of. That is what I think it's so valuable. And for kids that don't have a thought partner and can like drop something in there to spark something or give them an idea for, you know, a project, a paper, whatever, use that way. You, well, you can tell where I am on the AI. <laughs> a little, just a little yeah. excited, a I little know. more than, a little yeah. more than, eh, you know, <laughs> which would, which we will not be linking to the show notes that document. But uh, yeah. <laughs> you'll have to, you'll have to search for that California document. Apparently, but, but you know, that was one of the things that I found very uh, helpful. Like going back to the the graduate school course, I had an assignment that I wanted my uh, students to take part in, and um, I had the idea, and then I I put it into Chat GPT four. And I, it actually fleshed out some of the directions and steps that I had kind of omitted. Um, and it was like, if anything, it made the assignment more refined. And I had fewer questions from the students after rewriting it with my AI partner. And, but I didn't, I didn't hide it. I actually told the students, I co-wrote this assignment with ChatGPT. And here are the prompts that I provided for it. Because to your point, if teachers look at it as a cheap or a cheat, then you're anti. But if I'm showing that, hey, this is a college course, I'm showing you how you can you I can utilize this. Maybe you can utilize it too. You know, I kind of feel like that scene at the end of Rocky when he's in Russia. If I can change, you can change. We can all change. <laughs> No, we have a Rocky reference. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Just keeps going. Uh, yeah, that's. A, I yeah, think there's a lot. It's for a podcast for people of a certain age. <laughs> that's apparently because I. Yeah, we we've, we've mentioned war games in a previous podcast. Now, I mean, this is like it's kind of kind of before your time, Adam. But yeah, <laughs> I do. I think that's important too. I like that idea of the assistant. You know, an AI assistant. I mean, it's a teaching assistant, and it can be in such a way. But if you come to it with a lens. Uh, of fear and, and trepidation and, and cheat or cheap, as you said, Adam, I think that's where it's almost like getting just teachers to get their feet in it. I'm doing a training this next three days, same type of thing. It's all about, and they're like, give, give us everything about AI and the good, the bad. And then the number one thing every teacher asked for was give me an app that can show it when the kids are cheating. And I'm like, if that's the only reason you're using AI, it's like when we handed out the iPads 10 years ago, give me an app that gets my textbook and that's all I want. Right. It's like, it's so much more than that. So my job and your job always on a regular basis, Jenneth, is to always make people think, okay, let's look at it. Let's analyze it. So how would you, how would you approach a teacher who maybe looks at it as a lens of like, it's a, it's a thing I'm scared of. I don't want to touch it. I don't want anything to do with it. Cause I'm sure you have those in that you have a big district. So I'm sure you have some of those. We do. And, and the great thing is we actually had a, a small group of English teachers that were, got proactive, jumped on this AI bandwagon early in the year and started documenting everything, how they were using it, how they saw their high school students start to use it. It's this incredibly um, rich spreadsheet that they just put in things that they did, but they started taking their papers, things that their assignments, their prompts as teachers, put it in there. So I would you know, talk to teachers about, okay, first of all, like what Adam said, take what you're doing and, and see what AI comes up with, you know, you, you know, get them to tell you where are the holes in this? What, how can I make this a stronger project, paper, writing prompt, whatever it is, but then how about take a, a sample of a paper, put it, you know, ask AI or ask AI to write a paper and then give that to, on a topic, give it to all your students, same paper, and they have to add their personal touch to it, or they have to change it, or they have to make it better or tell you what's wrong. AI is, we know, not perfect, not even accurate all the time. So, you know, poke holes in it. Um, and, you know, there's just, I think what it is and why I love um, the opportunity, I think it, it it's really going to come down to giving teachers the opportunity to play. And when teachers get the opportunity to get into chat GBT or whatever they're using, BARD, Bing, whatever, um, see what it does, right? Try it. You you can fear what you don't know easily. All the, oh my gosh, scary. How can I stop this? How about let's just try it? Like, I think once they try it, they'll be like, oh, you know, I mean, how helpful, how great, not so scary. 
And again, like this one uh, high school teacher was like, I take a sample of every one of my 11th graders papers in the beginning of the year. So I know their writing style. Boom, done, easy. Well, wonder if those teachers, how, you know, the scared ones, how much are they reading <laughs> of their students' papers? What are they looking for? And so if you can't tell, then, you know, there's some other, I, I agree, like the cheat, you know, turn it in, plagiarism checker, um, you know, who else? Someone else is throw, oh, Edgenuity just threw one into theirs, you know, AI detection tool. Um, and that's what people are asking for. But no, we just need to like flip that lens, as you say, and look at it differently as, as a thought partner, as a support, as a efficiency, you know, product. It's going to help, help with lesson plans. Add, you know, make, write me a PE lesson plan, you know, that, that will include a um, hula hoop. Uh, they have to do 10 minutes of cardio and, and boom, there it is. Right. I mean, teachers don't have to do that anymore. I was talking with a, a AP the other day and I was like, just imagine using um, your AI for your scheduling. <laughs> so, you know, how many, how many yeah. people have lost hair, uh, time out of their lives, uh, time years, away from their families yeah. uh, on master scheduling? Uh, or even just using the AI in your personal life uh, just to create a, a, a grocery list. If you're trying to, if you're on a certain diet, I know someone's had allergies and they're like, okay, well, I want to make a certain diet plan based on my allergies. And and the AI spits out a perfect diet plan for them based on their allergies and their medical conditions and things of that nature. So just for just using it in your personal life, I think will kind of demystify some of that um, for teachers to then in turn use it in some of their classroom spaces. I agree. So we've, we've covered a lot of things in this episode uh, of our podcast with you. And, um, you know, you've had a lot of things going on of uh, in in your personal life with you, uh, but I, I do want to ask you this: um, What are some things or, that you do to keep yourself undisrupted in this in this space where there's so many things that can disrupt us from um, being happy, from having time to ourselves? What are some things that you do to keep yourself undisrupted? Well. Let's see. I have three labs. Yes. <laughs> and they are very helpful in in uh, disrupting me from a device <laughs> because they do not like it. My black lab, if I stand outside and have my phone in my hand and I'm playing ball with him, he'll stop. Seriously, I'm not even kidding. He'll stop <laughs> and wait until I put it down to play again. He, he, like, he gives so you wait like, time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm distracted. And he wants this one-on-one -on -one time with me. And I always think like for a while there, I was like, no, no, this isn't it. And like more and more, I'd like start testing my theory of like, it's the phone. He hates it. And um, every time I'd pick the phone up again, he'd just sit and look at me like with the ball between <laughs> us. And then I put the phone down and he gets up and like drops the ball closer. And it's like, okay, I'll engage with you again. And so, um, so I, I love being outdoors. And so I, I'm on walks a lot, even if I'm connected on a walk with a, an, I usually do an a audio book, but not work, you know, I kind of just go off and do some fun um, fiction things that, you know, I don't usually get time for. I, I do love the beach. I, you know, I, I, I've gotten a lot better about social media. I just, it, it's, it's, kind of like a time suck and it's fun to see what people are doing and go in there and it's you know I used to use Twitter for um, you know work and information and I'm I'm less on there and um, you know so I'll do it a little but then I'm like no I want to be in the here and now and you know family friends I um I'm starting to get out more again since you know uh, past health issues I've uh, yeah you've had You've had a lot. Uh, I was going to say, uh, you've inspired me quite a bit, Jenneth. You don't know this, but I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm friends with you on Instagram. And of course, you uh, put yourself out there so much with all the things that you've kind of had to go through over the last several years. And the fact that you don't let it derail you, it actually powers you through and you're still learning, growing, doing all the things that you're doing. 
You took the time out of your day when I went to visit you to drive me on in your Jeep to this beautiful spot, a little surfer bar on a beach, which I don't remember the name of it, but it's, it was awesome. I still like that was a, that was right before COVID. And I was like, I remember that memory. Yeah. Um, and so I just want to say from, from the bottom of my heart, uh, you know, I've known you for a long time and I appreciate all the stuff you do and just putting yourself out there. You, you, I mean, just inspiration to me. And, uh, I have some little health things that I have to deal with, but I watch you and I'm like, okay, you got this and you're powering through it. I can do, I can come overcome anything myself. I mean, I did, yeah, like I said, definitely I staying know. on social media for, for yeah. me, I appreciated your post on, uh, on social media going through the, I'm like, you know, she is a badass, and I'm going to say yeah. that on the podcast, Beep. you are a total badass. <laughs> I honestly don't, didn't know any other way because like I, you know, what was my thing? Only way out is through. And I, you know, I was, you, you could go into a spiral downward spiral of like, for me depression but really at the end of the day you didn't get rid of whatever you're battling right it's still there so life's too short right that's really how i kind of looked at it like and i also want i'm an educator so i want to educate yes and so you know i just thought well it, it helped me process and i'm going to educate you all more than you want to know about what you would might go through if this you know comes across your path so well, uh, it's taken us too long to get you on the podcast, but I'm glad you made it on, Jenneth. She is Jenneth Mishney, everybody. Um, Jenneth, where can we find out? I know you're not on social all the time, but where can people find out more about you and the great work that you're doing? Uh, that's a great question. I <laughs> do not. Um, I, I don't actually post a ton about work. Maybe that's my what I need to do for this year. There you go. <laughs> Link, <laughs> LinkedIn I for her work. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Talk to Carl and Adam. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I was going to say it used to be Twitter, but. Ah. X. Oh. <laughs> it's like wrong answer. <laughs> and on that note, folks. <laughs> thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone else for joining us. And for the listeners out there, be sure to subscribe and give us a shout out. Uh, we may even mention it on a future show. This has been the Undisrupted Podcast brought to you by All for Ed. He's Adam and you can follow him at, 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 at Ask Adam 3 And he's Carl and you can follow him at <laughs> at Mr. Hooker. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, we are better together. And we are better undisrupted. undisrupted. <laughs>